Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the morning session uh, of the second day of this conference. So it is with great pleasure to uh, uh, introduce Professor Matthew Emerton for the first talk in our morning. Over to you, Professor. Uh, the topic of my talk is uh, stacks of Gawa representations, or I could say moduli stacks. And um, so this is a topic uh, that I've been thinking about in uh, some contexts for a long time, but uh, it's also something which has suddenly seemed to become uh, of kind of interest and in importance to a lot of people and is uh, seeing some sort of uh, overlap of techniques between traditional methods in the theory of uh, automorphic forms and Gawa representations and ideas coming from the geometric language program. So I think it's a kind of interesting uh, topic and um, I want to explain some things about it. Um, so uh, the, so I want to begin by recalling um, deformation theory of uh, Gawa representations due to Mesa, we, we start with a Gawa group, an absolute Gawa group, so GK, which is Gawa of K bar over K, where K here could be uh, local or global. It, by the way, is this working? Can anyone? Yeah. Yes, it's working. Yeah. Great. Uh, so we start with some kind of mod p gamma representation, uh, continuous representation into G O two D of F P bar, and we imagine trying to lift this. Uh, into the into matrices over some Martinian thickening. I wrote FP bar here. I could have written FP or uh, a finite extension of FP. It doesn't matter so much. Um, and we try to uh, and we imagine thickening up row bar. And for example, in this way, we imagine approaching representations ultimately into GOD of um, well, ZP or maybe um, the way I'm writing things here, perhaps uh, the width vectors of FP bar or into, um, you could imagine sort of trying to make lifts like that or into um, uh, maybe into GOD of some uh, ring of integers O living over the some ramified extension of the width vectors of FP bar or into GOD of a completion of a Hecker algebra as in Ken Ribbett's talk uh, yesterday morning or yesterday night, depending where you are. Um, and so we, we, we start with a mod P Gawa representation and imagine trying to lift it over Artinian thickenings with the goal of kind of comparing uh, the deformations of some Gawa representation, perhaps to certain Gawa representations that we already might have. Um, and uh, a key feature of that theory is that in some situations, we obtain, so sometimes, <laughs> We obtain a universal deformation of row bar into, into the uh, matrices D by D matrices over R row bar, where R row bar is a so called universal deformation ring. Uh, That's some complete Netherian, uh, complete Netherian local ring, which as you do field, say FP bar. 
and um, and this is kind of the the limit of all the possible thickenings of rho bar. So uh, when 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 can we obtain this r rho bar? The key point is that um, we would need the automorphisms of rho bar to be trivial. Well, what do I mean by the automorphisms of rho bar? What I, what I mean is that you can, if you have this representation rho bar, you can conjugate it by matrices and get other representations, but some conjugations may preserve rho bar. So rho bar has some group, uh, some group of automorphisms. So the the um, the subgroup of d by d matrices that preserve it under conjugation, and we want those automorphisms to be trivial. I put trivial in quotes because actually, of course, the scalar matrices conjugate everything to itself. So the automorphisms, the automorphism group of Roba can never be literally the trivial group. It always contains the scalars. And so the smallest automorphism group we can have is the scalars sitting inside D or D of FP bar. And in that case, when uh, you have um, just scalar automorphisms, Mesa showed that you have this universal deformation ring. The kind of situations where this happens are, for example, if rho bar is irreducible, then by Scher's lemma, uh, the only automorphisms of rho bar are the scalars. Or another example could be that rho bar So what I'm writing here is I'm writing a description of a two-dimensional representation, which is a non, which is an extension of two characters. It has this character chi as a sub, it has this character psi as a quotient. And this star is some extension class, and I want this to be non-split. And if you have a non and I want these characters to be distinct. And if I have a non-split extension of distinct characters, then Again, the automorphisms of rho bar are trivial. So these are some cases when uh, we have the trivial automorphisms and we can make this deformation, we can make this lift of our rho bar. So, um, so, so as everybody here knows, I'm sure the deformation theory of Gower representations is to the extent it makes sense to talk about a theory being successful, this is an extremely successful theory. It plays a key role in the study of arithmetic of automorphic forms. It plays a key role in proving theorems in the Langlands program. But it sort of, I want to um, build on it in this talk. So I want to kind of explain I mean, what you might call some sort of um, some, some features that are lacking in this theory. And for that, I want to make an analogy with um, uh, sort of some other, uh, some other situations. So the situation I want to look at is say reps of a finally presented group. So let me suppose I have a finally presented group Uh, maybe it's generated by G1 to Gn with relations R1 up to Rt. And let's look at our d-dimensional reps. So to give a representation of this group, let's just call this group gamma. To give a representation of gamma, what do I have to do? I have to give matrices M1 up to Mn that are D by D matrices. Where are they going to lie? Well, let me look at, let me think of these representations as sort of being a functor on rings. So let me just say they lie in G or D of some ring. And I need these relations to be satisfied. So I need R1 of these matrices. 
up to r sub t of these matrices to all equal one. So, um, so if you think about it, this is an affine variety. So here I'm giving d squared entries in, well, I'm, well you know, uh, g or d is a variety. We have to give um, d squared numbers and we have to give the determinant and the inverse of the determinant. So we have, uh, so, so, uh, so we're giving a product of affine varieties, which is an affine variety. And then we're imposing these closed conditions, these equations, which are closed conditions. And so we get a closed sub variety of an affine variety. And so altogether, we get something that just to give it a name, we could call rep D of gamma. as an affine variety that parameterizes D-dimensional representations of gamma. And uh, the, um, well, we can, sort of how does this connect to uh, deformations? Well, I was a little bit um, lax in exactly describing deformations of rho bar because there's one point is that we want to consider, you know, if, if you have a, a deformation of rho bar and I have a deformation of rho bar and mine is obtained from yours just by changing basis, we don't want to think of them as being distinct. And in general, if we have representations of a group and my representation is obtained from your representation by changing basis, we don't want to think of them, they're isomorphic representations. We don't want to think of them as being distinct. So really what's happening is that on this variety, there's an action of the variety G or D. On this affine, on this affine scheme, there's an action of the uh, algebraic group G or D acting via conjugation. And the um, and the object that really classifies uh, kind of representations is the quotient. So maybe what I should put here is a little square. This square stands for frame. So framed representations means representations with a fixed basis, and that's what I've really written down here. I've written down these matrices acting on some fixed basis. And I can, if I get rid of the framing, a quotient out by GLD, that gives me an algebraic stack, a quotient stack. So this is an affine scheme even over Z, the way I've written it, but we could have a base field and it could be over that base field or we could have some other base ring we care about and it could be over that base ring. And this is an, a reductive group, a reductive algebraic group. And so this is a quite nice kind of an algebraic stack, a global quotient stack. And that's sort of the object which uh, that's the object which um, classify, kind of classifies representations of gamma. So just if you're not sort of used to, to stacks, the main difference between a stack and a, just a, a scheme is that when you think about uh, your Nader's lemma, and you think about what happens when you look at the representable functor represented by a scheme, it gives you a set valued functor. You have the, the maps from uh, a test object to a scheme are a set of maps. But when you map a test object to a stack, you get a groupoid. You don't get the values, the, the, the values of that functor on a test object are not sets, but groupoids. So in this case, we, when we evaluate this on a ring A, we get the groupoid of representations 
from gamma or g d of a. So why is this a groupoid? Well, because the objects are the set. The objects are just the representations from gamma to g or d a. But we can talk about two representations being isomorphic. And so they are, so this uh, set, some of the objects are isomorphic there. So it's a, um, it's a category in which all the arrows are isomorphisms. And that's what a groupoid is. So, and so that's um, what this algebraic stack does. So how does it relate to formal deformation theory? Well, in formal deformation theory, we fix, let, let's suppose you wanted to do formal deformation theory for gamma, but following the Gawa case, then we uh, we would fix a row bar And then we don't look at all, um, we don't sort of then look at arbitrary a valued points of this thing. We just look at, um, we kind of think about a thickening spec A, thickening up spec FP bar. And we have this fixed You have this fixed, um, sorry, I shouldn't, I should just be saying we have a map. We have this map row, row bar. So row bar is representation. So row bar is classifying an FP bar value point of our stack. And, uh, and we look at possible liftings row. So, um, so one, uh, so what we're doing when we study formal deformation theory is we're kind of probing, um, we're probing the behavior of this stack around a particular point. We're studying, if you like, the formal geometry of this stack or the formal completion of this stack at a particular point. But we are, um, but this stack may have geometry that, that the formal deformation theory doesn't see because, you know, the, if you kind of, you might be able to vary the row bar. And um, so, uh, so in formal deformation theory, you fix a, this closed point row bar, and you think about how this stack looks in an, sort of in the infinitesimal neighborhood of that point. But the stack itself has um, its entire geometry. So, for example, if you're in a situation where this stack was um, smooth, then its formal completion at a point would just, you know, the formal completion of a smooth variety at a point just sees a complete local ring with as many variables as the dimension of that variety. And it looks the same at all its points. So, so the formal completion of uh, a smooth variety at points doesn't see any of the actual geometry of the variety other than its smoothness. Whereas the variety itself, like if it was a surface, it might be a K3 surface or an equus surface or a surface of general type or an elliptic surface or a rational surface could have all kinds of geometry and phenomena that you can't see by looking at the formal deformation theory. So, um, uh, so what I want to um, talk about or is um, the idea of uh, doing these kind of um, moduli stacks of representations for, for Gawa representations. Um, I just want to make one other comment is that Mays' sort of theory, uh, I mean, these formal deformation rings really only exist when rho bar has these trivial, i.e. scalar automorphisms. Otherwise, as most people here will know, you in any case have to introduce framings to study deformations. Uh, and in this stacky context, What's happening is that the automorphisms of, well, when you look at a stack, it's a bit like an orbifold in topology. When you look at a stack, every point has a little orbit, has a little um, stabilizer group at that point. So in a scheme, every point just has a trivial stabilizer group. There's no kind of, um, there's no groupoid or there's no genuine groupoid or stack structure in a scheme. But in, in a genuine stack like this one, points have, um, 
have stabilizer groups, which in this context, the stabilizer group will just be, when you look at this conjugation action, each point we can look at the subgroup of GLD that preserves a given uh, representation under conjugation, and that will be the stabilizer of that particular point. So, um, so what's happening? Uh, so what happens is that when you look at a closed point like this point row bar, or, or I shouldn't call it a closed point, but a field value point like this point row bar, in a scheme, a point sitting inside this, like an FP bar value point sitting in a scheme would just be a closed point in the scheme if it was a scheme over with vectors of FP bar, for example. But here, you don't see, you, you, you shouldn't think of the image of this, uh, you shouldn't think of the image of this point as being a point in here. You should think of it as, a, as this point, spec of FP bar, this image in the stack is a point modulo the automorphisms of rho bar. So its image is, is a little stack, which is the stack, which is one point modulo a non possibly, well, in our case, always non-trivial group. And uh, Mays' assumption is that this thing is as simple as possible. Um, it's just a uh, a point. So Mays' assumption is that this is just the scalars, so the multiplicative group. And uh, in that case, this this little stack here classifies line bundles, giving a giving a test. If you have a test scheme and you map it to a point mod GM, that's the same as giving a line bundle. And so what that what that reflects is that if I give you an um, if I give you a scheme with a line bundle on it, and I give you an irreducible, say, representation of your group, you can tensor that irreducible representation with the line bundle to get a non-trivial family of representations over your base scheme, where the non-triviality is coming not from the representation varying, but just from the the kind of vector space that is taking values on being twisted by this line bundle. It will be like a kind of an isotrivial family of representations in a sense, analogous to in uh, in the moduli theory of varieties when we can find iso isotrivial families of varieties. So families of varieties that are not trivial families, but where the isomorphism class of the variety is constant, the isomorphism class of the, of the members of the family is constant in the family, but the family is not just a trivial family. So, uh, but if the automorphisms are more complicated, then the um, then this stack is a is a more complicated then this little point stack is a more complicated thing, and the way in which the uh, representation can vary is more complicated. So essentially, the reason sort of Mazur's deformation theory works when rho bar is irreducible and you have these scalar automorphisms is that this line bundle, this kind of line bundle that's implicit in this description, you can ignore it over a over a local ring. All line bundles are trivial. Uh, you know, a, a, a projective module over a local ring is actually free. So you don't, so you, so over local rings, you don't have to worry about this line bundle stuff. And so you can ignore, you could ignore these automorphisms when they're scalars. But in the case of um, more complicated row bars with more complicated automorphisms, so row bars that are not irreducible, say, um, Th th this this thing will be more complicated. So this thing will be more complicated, and stack the language of stacks is a natural way to think about the situation. So so in in Mazur's deformation theory, one tends to just say that you don't have a universal deformation ring, and you kind of stop. But the language of stacks gives you a way to um to think about the situation, um, and uh and sort of try and talk about it. And I want to try and give some examples. Uh, a little bit later to, to somehow illustrate what I mean by that. But the first thing I want to talk about is the local story. Um, and uh, what I'm going to say is due to, um, to many people, uh, something I thought about at various points and David Helm thought about at various points, 
as written about, and then um, uh, Schultze has recently thought about it, uh, and then Jin Wenju has thought about it, and there should be a, a, other names here. I think um, I should probably have uh, Richard Taylor's name in here, and his student Choi is in here. Um, so all, so, the, so this is all what I'll call L not equal to P. And so, so I, I want to explain. So what I want to look at is K, so I'll have QL, so K over QL is finite. And I'm gonna look at piadic representations as I did before, or mod P and re representations and their deformations as before. But I wanna make a, not just a formal deformation theory, but I wanna make a stack. Um, so, the, um, the problem with making a stack of, of Gawa representations is that the Gawa group of K is not a finitely presented group. It's a, it's a profinite group. And so I can't really follow this procedure. So in, when I look at Gawa representations, I want to find continuous representations of the Gawa group. And, um, and so the, the ring should have a topology and, and then um, and the, the Gower groups are not necessarily finitely presented. And if I'm not kind of careful to have everything make sense, I basically end up having to put myself back in the situation where A is a complete local ring so that I can talk about continuous representations and I'm back in Mazes context. So how do I avoid that? Well, let me, what, what does it mean to write down a, a, a kind of an algebraic family of representations? What does it mean to write down a, you know, a, a family of objects in, in mathematics? It basically means you write down an object, but it depends on a parameter. Like if we go back to, I mean, that's something stupid, but just to sort of explain what I mean, if we go back to high school, we write down this family of quadratics when you learn the quadratic formula. And the point is you, we have these parameters, A and B. So writing down a family of objects means we write down something that depends on a parameter. So in Gawa, in, in local Gawa theory, what's something we write that depends on a parameter? Well, one thing we write is we write down, we write down this family of characters. We write down an unramified character where here X is maybe in FP bar star. So an unramified character whose uh, value on Frobenius, so this is an, a character that sends the Frobenius to the number X. And X is an arbitrary element in FP bar star. So this is kind of a family of representations in the naive sense that it's some collection of representations that depends on the parameter X. So uh, if we really wanted then to um, make this into a true family, what we would say is, as algebraic geometers, is we would say, ah, oh, I'm supposed to take this symbol X, which is standing for kind of a specific but unspecified element of FP bar star, and instead think of it as being a variable. So I should instead imagine of X as being a, a variable, maybe inside FP bar or join X, X inverse, which is kind of the universal invertible choice of X. And then I should imagine a universal character, which sends Fabinius to that element X. So the only thing is that this formula doesn't make sense as a Gawa representation because there's no topology here where this could be a continuous representation. After all, the unramified Gawa group, if we look at the unramified Gawa group, so the maximal R, the Gawa group of the maximal unramified extension of K over K, that's a copy of Z hat uh, generated by Frobenius. So it's a unit, it's a, um, a, a top of the kind of a completion, profinite completion of the cyclic group generated by Frobenius. But we know where we want to send Frobenius to X, but this doesn't extend to a continuous representation of Z hat, because after all, there's not really any topology you could put on this thing apart from the discrete topology. And if you want to have a, um, a continuous map from this profinite group to this discrete group, the image would have to be finite order. 
And so we kind of, so then we sort of see why this makes sense. This thing makes sense because any element of FP bar star has finite order. Because any element of FP bar star is in some finite extension of FP and so it has finite order. But if we kind of collect all those elements into the symbol X, this element X does not have finite order inside here. But that's okay because inside Z hat, we have the actual copy of Z generated by Frobenius. And this makes perfect sense as a representation of Z. And so we can replace this Gawa group Z hat by its natural subgroup generated by Frobenius Z. And more generally then we could replace, we could look at the Gawa group of K, uh, K bar over K, at least as a first step, we could look at the Gawa group of K bar over K, which maps to the Z hat as a quotient. And inside here, we could take Z. And so inside here, we could take the pre-image, which is called the vague group of K. And so for example, this, um, this formula makes perfect sense, not as an unnormified Gawa rep, but as an unnormified vague group rep. Now, so the vague group is still not a discrete group. So the kernel of this map, of course, is inertia. And the kernel of the map from the vague group to Z is also equal, it's the same subgroup, it's just the inertia group. The inertia group is still pro-finite. And so we, um, we still haven't kind of converted the Gawa group into something discrete, but the inertia group is also a pro-cyclic group. So the inertia group is isomorphic to a product over uh, P not equal to L. Yeah, so as an extension of QL. So P not equal to L of ZP twisted by one. And uh, sorry, the, the tame inertia group, I should say, looks like this. So this is uh, tame inertia looks like this. And so, so this is also a pro, uh, uh, a um, pro cyclic group. And so we could choose a generator sigma of this, or maybe, um, maybe I'll call it kind of tau for tame. And in fact, um, I can do the following thing. So if I look at Gawa K bar over K tame, so the tame quotient, so that's the, that's the extension. So that has tame inertia as a sub and the unnamified Z hat as a quotient. Inside, I can look at the following finally generated group, which is I have sigma, which is I choose a lift of Frobenius and tau, which is this tau. And I have the commut commutation relation equals tau to the Q, Q is the order of the residue field. So it's a power of L. Um, the, the, this commutation relation is what this symbol is reflecting. And this is, uh, this is a finitely, finitely generated subgroup, which is dense inside here. And giving a, uh, well, th this thing, this, this Tangawa group is the profinite completion of this finitely presented group. So giving representations with finite image, continuous representations into, a, in some, into something discrete with finite image is the same to give a, a representation of this group or of this group kind of gamma. But this group gamma is, is discrete. And so we can look at representations of this group gamma into um, into polynomial rings, or you know, into all kinds of FP or ZP algebras. And finally, if we think about the wild inertia, the wild inertia is a pro L group. And so, if we're working in characteristic P or in or in mob powers of P, a pro L group's deformation theory is rigid. You can't deform the representations of a pro L group when you're working in characteristic P. And so. Uh, so we don't really have to worry about um, wild inertia. So we can we can think of um, oh, I don't know 
what just happened there. Sorry, I've done something to my screen that I don't fully understand, but that's okay. Here we go. So um, we can think of our We can describe it as an inverse limit over Q, where here Q is uh, an open subgroup of wild inertia, which is normal. See, this is GK, normal in GK. We can find a basis of open neighborhoods of open subgroups of wild inertia, which is, which is actually normal in GK. And so we can look at GK mod Q. Um, so that's sort of a, a description of G, GK as an uh, inverse limit. And then, and then we have wild inertia mod Q is, this is finite because Q is open in wild inertia, goes to the GK, goes, and then the, when we kill off wild inertia, we get GK tame. And so inside there, we can put this group gamma and then some subgroup here that I might call WD sub Q. So WD kind of stands for Vedaline. And here I have this finite quotient of wild inertia. So this thing is an extension of a finitely presented group by this finite group. So this is finitely presented. And so we can look at our reps of, um, of dimension D of this Vedalin group of Q, let's say we could think of it over um, sort of over say ZP. And this will be some variety over ZP. And then we can um, sort of, if you increase Q, as if you make, if you shrink Q, or if you shrink Q down so that this WDQ gets bigger, so this, this, you just get um, each of these, each of these guys is, is an algebraic stack just of the kind I saw before, I had before. And then if we take a union over Q, we just get, uh, we kind of get a union of more components. So this is a kind of um, locally finite type algebraic stack. And its formal completions at points give you formal deformations of, uh, as formal completions at FB bar points give you formal deformations of those, um, of those representations. So this is kind of a moduli stack of local Gawa representations when L is not equal to P. Um, so it's just a, it's a, a version of the traditional theory of the Vedalin group, which kind of takes local Gawa representations in the L not equal to P case and makes them, uh, and makes them sort of discrete, except that because I, but the, the traditional version of the Vedalin group, you take a log of tame inertia. So that's not so good in mixed characteristic. Taking a log tends to mean you have to be in characteristic zero. So this is a version which um, works well in mixed characteristic. And this is what, uh, for example, um, so what I've explained is, is it appears in a recent preprint of you in some detail, but, but what I've explained is also how people like uh, Richard Taylor in his school uh, compute local deformation rings in the L not equal to P case. They use this gamma. So when L equals P, the situation is more complicated because you can't expect uh, you can't expect um, representations of uh, I mean, I, I, if you make piadic deformations of a Gawa representation of the local Gawa group of a piadic or the Gawa group of a piadic field the wild inertia can, the, the, the wild ramification be, can become worse and worse as you make your piadic deformation. So when you're doing uh, an elatic field and you're making piadic deformations, the wild inertia can't deform. 
But when you're doing periodic deformations of your periodic field, wild inertia can deform. And so you can't use this way. This, you, if you try to use this Vedaline method, you, you don't get a very good um, moduli stack. And so when L equals P, one can use phi gamma modules. instead to make a moduli stack. And so this is joint work with Toby G. Um, so I don't wanna to say too much more about that now because I want to talk about the global case. Um, so, so in the function field case, in the function field case, there's also a procedure if you can replace the, um, you know, the, the, if you have a, a curve over a finite field, the Gawa group, of that function field maps to the Gawa group of the finite field, which gives you a, a Z hat again. So the function field case is a lot like this case. The Gawa group of the function field maps to Z hat, which is a Gawa group of the finite field. And the kernel is now the um, geometric fundamental group of the curve. The, the, the Gawa group is kind of the arithmetic sort of fundamental group of a, of the, of a of the, well, the curve after you allow infinitely many punctures, and then this is sort of the geometric fundamental group. And you can replace this z hat by a z, and you get a vague group. And so you can look at uh, you can look at stacks of um, vague group groups. And you get a nice theory, and this is in a recent paper of uh, Jin Wen Zhu. And, um, and another version phrased differently, but essentially giving the same answer, is in also in a recent preprint of Gates Gori et al. So I want to focus on the number field case. So, um, so the number field case, actually, some of these ideas were suggested maybe 10 or so years ago by Mark Kissen and were developed in the thesis of Carl uh, Wang Erickson. Um, Although I don't think he, he brought out all the kind of implications of the theory he developed. And uh, I want to describe sort of what happens. So I, I want to just do the following thing. I want to uh, consider K is a number field. P is going to be a prime. Uh, S is going to be some finite set of places. Including all places at infinity and at P. And then I'm going to look at uh, representations from GKS into GLD of A. What kind of an A am I going to put here? A is just going to be it's going to be a ZP algebra that's killed by some power of P. And I'm going to ask, and I'm going to think of it as being discrete.
So you can definitely think that it could be something like FP brackets X or, um, and I'm gonna ask that this row be continuous. And so that, so I can look at those representations and that's a groupoid. And so it defines a stack that I'll call X of A. And this, um, maybe a priori, we don't know very much about this stack. I've, I've, I've evaluated it on algebras that are ZP algebras that are killed by a power of P. So what that means is that this stack X lives over the formal spectrum of ZP. That's just that's by by the very by virtue of sort of having these kind of test objects. That means that it lives over the formal spectrum of ZP. Now, what you can do if you have a representation, you can take its trace or its characteristic polynomials and get a pseudo representation or uh, a determinant in the language of Wiles and Taylor and Chenevier and so on. So. So this X maps to a space that I'll call Roman X, which is sitting over spec of ZP. So this is the, um, well, this is a formal scheme parameterizing uh, pseudo representations, d-dimensional. Pseudo representations. Oops. But it, it turns out that uh, over FP bar, pseudo representations of a Gawa group can't deform. So, with, so that's a th theorem of Chenevier. So this X is just a disjoint union over all, well, all the, all the residual pseudo representations. And a residual pseudo representation is the same thing as a representation to FP bar, which is semi-simple. So continuous, simple. It's a disjoint union of these pseudo deformation spaces. Of the, so these are so these are the pseudo deformation rings. And so X sits over X, and this thing is a disjoint union of these guys. So correspondingly, our X is a disjoint union over of components where this where the um where you are kind of finding representations whose underlying pseudo representation deforms this given row bar. And I want to um, kind of show you, I want to illustrate what this could can look like. So if row bar is irreducible, X of row bar is Mazes formal deformation ring. And the stack will be that thing where we have to quotient out by an appropriate formal completion of GM, which are the automorphisms, acting trivially. So this group, this GM is acting trivially. And so it's uh so essentially, um, that tells you that to deform, uh, you know, sort of giving a def giving a in the stack world deforming, uh, giving a family of representations, is sort of giving a formal. You kind of have to give a formal deformation of row bar. 
but you also get to vary it over some line bundle. I want to show you what this uh, stack can look like if row bar is reducible. And I want to talk about, for example, Ken's case. Uh, from yesterday, where row bar is equal to trivial plus cyclo. Let me, so then, um, what, what kind of things can happen? So let me uh, look at the following example. So I want to look at uh, S. I want to take K equals Q. I want to take S to be, of course, infinity, 5 and 11. I mean, characteristic, I want to do like five adic representations. And I want to look at this X. And I want to fix the determinant to be cyclotomic. I want to fix a condition at five to be finite flat. So finite flat at five. And I want to be semi-stable At 11. So if you think in terms of modular forms, we're asking that we're, um, we're looking at five adic representations. I'm asking the determinant to be the cyclotomic character. I'm finite flat at five and I'm semi stable at 11. So this will be looking at modular forms on gamma 0, 11 in weight two. Those are the kind of modular forms that contribute to this stack. And there are two eigenforms in weight two on level gamma zero 11, the Eisenstein series and the um, cusp form. And so the X, there's only one row bar. So there's one row bar, which is exactly this this guy, it's the unique row bar. And x, so so the x is just I don't need to put the row bars because there's one row bar, and the x is the spoof of the Hecker algebra, which is two copies of Z five. glued in characteristic five. So one copy of Z5 is the, so this is a kind of thing Ken had in his talk yesterday. One copy of Z5 is acting on the Eisenstein series. One copy of Z5 is the uh, eigenvalues of the cusp form, but they're congruent mod five. So these two copies of Z5 are glued along their common quotient F5. Um, so, so what does X look like? over this uh, Z5. So X is kind of over this guy. So X also has two components. So what are they, so the row bar is trivial plus cyclo. So what, are, so there's an Eisenstein component. So I'm just gonna draw these rather than write them. So that's supposed to be a picture of a, of a closed unit disc. So that's a closed unit disk. Where blue bar t is less than equal to one. And it's coming from uh, extensions of uh, trivial by cyclotomic. So 
if the um, if your pseudo deformation if, if the trace of your representation is equal to trivial plus cyclotomic then you can be a non-trivial extension of of trivial by cyclotomic and because we're only allowing ramification at 11 the only um, way to get such a non-trivial extension is from the Kummer class attached to 11. And so the Kummer class at 11 gives us basically this one dimension of, uh, of Gawa representations. And then we also have the cusp form, which, which gives us an irreducible representation into the, into the field over the field of five adic numbers. But the, the, the residual representation is reducible. So it has a collection of lattices inside it that are parameterized by the points of this annulus, which is the absolute value of T is in between 25 and one. So that annulus is parameterizing lattices, Gower invariant lattices inside the mod five Gower representation. When you, when you reduce, when you look at the special fiber of this thing, you get a line. When you look at the special fiber of this thing, you get two lines. And one of these lines should be glued to this line. So these two get glued along uh, a, a line that they each contain in characteristic five, which is sort of a more geometric emulation of this gluing of these rings along a point in characteristic five. And both of these things, there should be a quotient. So there should be a quotient by a GM here and a set of quotient by a GM. So that's the kind of a picture that illustrates all the um, Gower representations that can correspond to this Eisenstein, uh, Eisenstein maximal ideal that was appearing in Ken's talk yesterday. And uh, so I'm out of time. But I think uh, studying these um, stacks will kind of shed light on some of the questions that Ken was talking about yesterday and related questions about uh, the theory, um, well, cohomology of modular curves or more generally Shimura varieties and automorphy, the connection with automorphic forms in the case when you have uh, residually reducible Gower representations. So there's kind of a, a stacky geometry that um, in the local and also global case that sort of is more refined than what you see just looking at pseudo representations. Um, so there's, uh, there, are many, there are many sort of uh, promising connections that seem to be appearing between, uh, between the ideas that come out of this um, stacky point of view and especially its connection to geometric Langlands and things like taylor Wiles patching and the other methods in the theory of automorphy. So um, in any case, I'm out of time, so I should stop there. So thank you for listening. Thanks, Professor Merton. Um, are there any questions? So you expect a congruence between cast forms and Eisenstein series, right? Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, so in this case, in, in various yeah. cases. Um, for example, Ken, Ken, in his talk yesterday, explained some conditions for these congruences. So, this, so those conditions are related to the, um, for example, one way you prove those conditions like the conditions, the necessary conditions for congruence between cast forms and Eisenstein series that Ken explained in his talk yesterday. One way you prove those conditions, in fact, the normal way you prove those necessary conditions is by local arguments. And so in this context, that would be that you have a restriction map from the stack of global representations to the stack of local representations. And then the geometry that appears in the stack of local representations kind of constrains something about the there's some constraints then on this global represent on this global stack by the way it maps to the local stack which can help you understand some of the arguments that underlie things Ken said yesterday and my hope is that they'll not only explain some existing arguments but 
uh, help develop you know, new arguments. Thank you. There is a question from Hijong Lee from, uh, in the chat. So he asked that, can we construct the frame version of moduli stack as you did for finite groups? Uh, sure, you, you can, um, in fact, probably the way I said things, I mean, if you just look at the stack of representation, if you look at the, um, just the set of uh, representations into GLD, you get the frame stack. And then when you quotient that by isomorphisms, you get the quotient stack. Um, the, um, but there, when you, I think when you study Taylor Wiles patching and related questions, the stackiness is important. I had a quick question. Uh, in the n equals to p case, uh, do you expect uh, a similar uh, kind of a stated theory that you have for uh, you know this uh, deformation theory in the case of elliptic curves and the tape model? Uh, so, um, sorry. I mean, in the so in the local L equals P theory, so Toby G and I worked out there's a, there is uh, there are these moduli stacks, and one can sort of describe their picture. They have um, I mean there's a there's a fairly kind of complete theory. Uh, and it will play a role in this global theory as well. It's um uh, for example. If you look at this global stack and you map to the product, it will all be the divide P of the local stack. This map should have some sort of nice geometric property. So this should be uh, representable. By algebraic stacks. That's a conjecture of uh, mine and Jin Wenju. So I should say that uh, this number field case is is on is work in progress, joint between me and uh, Jin Wenju. So joint with Zhu. And uh, th this restriction map from the global to the to the local at p places should be um, uh, an algebraic morphism. Although these are although these are formal algebraic stacks, this map should be representable by algebraic stacks, and that should be a geometric way of kind of encoding the idea that um, people here who do deformation theory will be familiar with, which is that uh, globe. If you take a um, if you take inside a local at p deformation ring and you take a crystalline locus for some choice of Hodge Tate weights. And then you look at the image of the global deformation space. The global deformation spaces always have kind of finite intersection with uh, crystalline deformation spaces. So, so this statement um, is kind of a geometric reformulation of that intuition. Um, There's another question in the chat box uh, from Daniel. Uh, is there a stacky counterpart for uh, Hecke algebras? Well, the, yeah, I mean, in some sense, the Hecke algebras will, should be these, um, are, are going to be these pseudo deformation rings. But there is, but in fact, there, there's a, there's an, the answer is yes, but it's somewhat elaborate. And I, I don't have so much time probably to explain now. But, um, the rough idea is that if you look at the local stacks, they have they should have GIT quotient at least for, for at places away from P. They should have GIT. Well, they will have GIT quotients, and those GIT quotients should be related to the Bernstein center, which is like a local version of a Hecke algebra. Uh, and but the um, but kind of doing sheaf theory on these stacks should be some enhancement of the theory of the Bernstein center. So there are these conjectures that the category of uh, the category of a of uh, smooth representations of GLN 
K can be realized fully faithfully as certain coherent sheaves on these local stacks. And then uh, those coherent sheaves on the local stack should be related to um, should be related to uh, cohomology of modular curves or more generally Shimura varieties via Taylor Wiles patching. And so these maps, these global to local maps together with this uh, conjectures about coherent sheaves um, should be some kind of uh, some reinterpretation and and uh, rethinking of the kind of Taylor Wiles patching method. And um, I, I think a very interesting one. Uh, and so so understanding that, so understanding kind of how Taylor Wiles patching works in these residually reducible cases. So for example, like Taylor Wiles, the, the patching of Skinner Wiles in the residually reducible case, understanding how Taylor Wiles patching works, but interpreting it in terms of these stacks, I think is a very important question. And I, it's sort of, uh, I think it's sort of where the answer to that question lies as well. There's another question from Aditya. Uh, it says, how does local global compatibility figure in the case of number field stacks, if at all? Yeah, so local global compatibility will be, uh, the following statement. So you have this X and you map to the product over V in S of uh, XV. And uh, on XV, there should be these coherent sheaves Uh, if you if you choose a level structure or something like this, there should be uh, coherent sheaves here that correspond to a choice of level structure. And then we can kind of tensor them all together uh, sort of to get a coherent sheaf on this product. We can call this map F. We can call this product. So we can call this whole thing A then we could pull back, we could do what's called a shriek pullback. So F up a shriek of A. That's a coherent sheaf now on X. Now I'm going to tensor that over X, there's a universal Gawa representation, rho sub X. So I tensor the universal Gawa representation. And then I could take global sections on X. And so the, the conjecture is that this should equal the compactly supported cohomology of whatever Shimura variety context we were in that determined these level structures. So that's a formula which, um, so these are kind of locally determined by local Langlands and uh, these conjectures about coherent sheaves so these are conjectures of um, the basic references is this recent paper of Jin Wenju. There's a lot of related work by uh, Fag and Schultzer and by uh, Benz V. Chen, Hellman Nadler and by Eugen Hellman. But I think the kind of clearest uh, discussion in the literature is this recent paper of uh, Jin Wenju. And he makes a corresponding, con he makes this conjectural statement he in that paper he makes it in the function field case so then the Shimura varieties will be, be replaced by a moduli stack of Stuka. but so so that's a description of cohomology of mod, of Shimura varieties in terms of these stacks and these maps and so for example one thing that Jin Wen and I have tested is in that uh in that example in level 11 we've studied enough of this map to see why it is that you get, why a modular curve of level 11 has compactly, when you localize it in Eisenstein prime, it has cohomology in two degrees. It has compactly supported cohomology in degrees one and two. And so we've seen that, uh, we've, we've sort of produced that from this formula. Um, on the other hand, if, uh, if, you, if you look at an irreducible row bar, then um, 
then basically this X is already more or less just an affine scheme. It's more or less just spec of R over bar. And there's not so much happening in this global sections part of this formula. And, uh, and, and this should more or less, this, this formula here should, should more or less be the, um, be a kind of opposite of Taylor Wiles patching. So for example, this conjectural formula would sort of say that the Taylor Wiles patch modules are purely local and are governed by these coherent sheaves. But but one thing is that in general at the prime P, at primes that divide P, there's very little known about this situation. This So this will be in the case where V, Zhu will discuss the case where V doesn't divide P. The case where V divides P is related to p -adic local Langlands. And if, and it's completely, uh, I mean, it's completely conjectural at this point. I mean, there's, there's, no, there's no kind of proposed candidates for what these things are in that case, other than for uh, GL2QP, where we do have a p -adic local Langlands. Um, so in the case of GL2QP, uh, it's ongoing work of, Andrea Dotto and myself and Toby G to build these coherent sheaves and then to prove local global compatibility. Um, yeah, so, so these things are super related to local global compatibility and that's uh, one of my main reasons for being interested in them. Are there any more questions or comments? If not, then uh, let's thank uh, Professor Martin again. Uh... Thank, you. thank you very much. And thank you for your patience with uh, my uh, technical snafus. Okay. All right. OK, so we'll, huh. Huh. so we'll meet uh, in 14 minutes. Uh, that will be 10.30 Indian time for the next talk.